Good evening and welcome to the 45th uh, Archives Public Lecture Series. On behalf of the team at the Archives at NCBS, I would, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. This particular edition of the lecture series is a very special one, as it is our first in-person lecture on campus and of 2022 after a very long break caused by the pandemic. We are so grateful to be in a room um, full of people again and to share this space with all of you today. For those of you who are new to this forum, the Archives at NCBS is a public center for the history of contemporary biology in India. The lecture series is one of our programming activities of the Archives, which was started in 2018 and initially focused on history of science. It has since then evolved broadly into a history of ideas series and is framed broadly on explora exploration in and around the Archives. In the past, we've hosted discussions by artists, writers, lawyers, teachers, journalists, and many more who have drawn from their vast body of expertise to share their work with us. We have with us today, Dr. Sundar Sarukai. Dr. Sarukai has worked extensively on the philosophy of natural and social sciences. He is currently a visiting member of, of the faculty at the Center for Society and Policy, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He's also the founder of Barefoot Philosophers Initiative, which was funded with the intention of reintroducing philosophy into education of all disciplines. Uh, he has extensively published uh, a range of books, including Translating the World, uh, Experience Cast and the Everyday Social, and most recently, a children's book titled Philosophy for Children. Today's talk is titled uh, Body as of an Archive, Matter, Memory and Absence. And it will draw on connections between the physical body and the archives uh, as a space of historical record. Welcome, Dr. Sarukai, and thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this lecture series. Uh -huh. Share. Share on the screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Sanjana. Thank you, Venkat, for this uh, invitation to be uh, to give this talk here. It's a great pleasure to come back for a very long time to NCBS, and lovely to see the kind of uh, expansion which has happened here. Um, I must also say that you know I've always been doing these talks standing up, and for the last two years I've been doing it sitting down. And even the course I've been teaching at IAC, I was hoping it would all open up. And but even this semester, we're still doing sitting down. So it's really, I feel really uncomfortable now back to standing up and talking to all of you. And uh, thank you so much, Venkat, for uh, accommodating this request because I was saying, uh, you know, I don't want to do another online talk. And uh, it's really lovely to just to be with, even in an empty room, it'd be nice to just walk around and speak. So thank you all for coming. It's such a pleasure to be here and share some ideas and thoughts with you. Um, you know, I was, I've always been wondering about the, this, this uh, archive here at NCBS. And many of us, of course, not just in Bangalore, but elsewhere, have heard about it. I've, I've also been uh, hearing about the work from different contexts, including from theater and the art community. And um, I've had occasion to uh, run into my kid once in a while. But I, I was, um, you know, given my larger interest in science studies, which is where my real interest lies in studying science institutions, understanding the nature of scientific disciplines and practices, I, of course, was very struck by this um, establishment of an archive here. And I must say that Obaid Siddiqui, uh, being somebody who was also, um, you know, instrumental in the early parts of NIAS, when I joined NIAS very early on, that's the National School of Advanced Studies in 94, when um, you know he was in our council and he would come there to you know, set up many of the programs we did. So there's always been a kind of an awareness of the, the kind of things which were happening here. But 
the question of the archive raises so many questions for those of us in the social sciences or reflecting through a social science uh, framework mm -hmm. that I went, went back to use this context of this talk to just ask myself the question, what does uh, archive in a biological institute mean? You know, one of our premier institutes in the country, if not the world, and what does it actually mean to set up an archive which brings in questions from the questions which the archive raises are not scientific questions alone. They raise very deep questions about the practice of science, the function of science, the community of scientists, and even things like keeping records and what does what do all these mean and so on. So uh, using that as an excuse and using that as a framework, I wanted to reflect on this idea of first about the question of biology and the archive and what came to my mind eventually was to understand it in a much larger context in context of the human body. Uh, an idea which is, which is so contested today in the social sciences and humanities and perhaps less contested in biology, I don't know. And please correct me if, if um, you know, my biological knowledge is woefully inadequate. Um, but this idea of the body is so fundamental to many of the um, you know, humanistic and social science formulations in the world today across disciplines. In fact, in so many disciplines, the body has become center. And part of the struggle is to understand what is this thing called the body, other than its biological manifestations, other than its descriptions of various biological processes. So I wanted to, when I saw the way I wanted to enter into this was, of course, to go back to something which I know a little about, which is my discipline of philosophy. And I was curious to see what would be the kind of philosophical questions one would ask about archives. And of course, uh, you know, talking about philosophy in a science institute is always, quote unquote, slightly dangerous. But I thought that's all like I can speak about. So I'm going to use that framework to set up some questions I want to set up about the nature of an archive. And very interestingly, although there is not too much work, and I'm sure people like Venkat can, uh, are the experts in this, but if you look at the literature on philosophy of an archive, so philosophical reflections, philosophical questions on what an archive means and so on, there have been some recent um, you know, summaries of certain positions which people have uh, taken. So I'm just um, summarizing some fundamental themes from a conference on philosophy of archive uh, in the UK which was also published as a series of uh, articles. So I thought that will also give you an entry into, um, you know, for those of you who want to look at more into this, to go look at it. So first of all, when we talk about a philosophy of a philosophy of an archive, what are we talking about? We ask various simple questions like, what is an ontology of archiving? What do we mean by the ontologies of archiving is, what are the constituent materials in an archive? What do you keep in an archive? It could range from photographs, it could, I, I saw this uh, many examples of what is happening in the archive here before I came here. It could be letters, photographs, pictures, collection of materials, maybe lab equipment and so on. And the question here is, what is it, what would you choose to keep in an archive? There are so many other things you may not have kept in an archive. So what do you choose to keep in an archive? In other words, what kind of materialities, what kind of things, what kind of records you like, uh, if you want to call them that, do you actually store and keep and call that as an archive. So it has very interesting questions about what gives the identity of an archive, what should be there in an archive in a general sense. Um, there have also been questions within this discussion of the philosophy of an archive to look at uh, what are called open-ended ontologies, which is not to look at uh, archive as a very static structure where you have kept some 10 records and 10 photographs and 10 letters and say, that's what an archive is. And archive never does the function. I mean, therefore, there's a dynamic open-endedness to it, uh, which includes, that's why I said I was very excited to see an archive in the middle of a flourishing science institute, because that dialogue or that disagreement and that conversation is actually a very important function of all archives around the world. So, uh, the, so archivists would really want to focus on this idea of the open-ended ontology. And, um, you know, repeatedly in major questions about archives around the world, one of the most important questions has been about, and this has very deep philosophical significance as I'll come back to later, is about the difference between a record and an event, which is, uh, you know, you are recording something and something has happened. So it could be, let's say, the origin of this, of this institute many years ago. And you want, that's a, if you 
call that as an event and you want to record it and you have do certain things to exhibit that record of it but is archive just about record first and secondly what does it mean to record an event you could for example if you say you're recording this event of me speaking here and then you would archive it in some sense even the very idea of what an event is what do you choose to record what constitutes the points of interest in an event that is recorded are very deep uh, very very deep and difficult questions about archive and therefore the two kinds of questions which people have been moving towards looking at archive is archive is not the static structure but it's about the process of meaning making it makes meaning for people who enter into it who engage with it it's a process of it's a, it's a, actually a very uh, dynamic living text and more importantly in recent time there have been a lot of um, you know discussions on the use of archives to talk about questions of for for example questions of justice and protection of rights so many of the accounts of people who are trying to keep archives are for those who are being suppressed and marginalized and whose voices are not being heard in the larger mainstream media archives allow you to give them a place of voice which can be enabled at some time or the other but the fact is archive is not just a, a, a documentation center it becomes centrally a a, a, a place which engages with questions of uh, as i said justice and ideas of rights um so you could as i said look far more uh, more deeper into this uh, thing in this uh, piece called along with against the grain now what are philosophically interesting for me just to give you a very broad overview of how one would one can ask certain kinds of questions upon which many of these ideas depend upon they depend upon very simple questions and 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 i said these are very fascinating philosophical questions and i'm sure you've thought about this in different ways for those of you who work on archives the question of the reality of the past what does a past what does it mean to say that the past is real what does it mean to say that well an institute like this had a past and something did happen on a particular day when a foundation stone was laid or whatever it is what does it actually mean to engage uh, to uh, create an idea called the past which seems to have a notion of being real which is being recorded just like the table is real and i take a photograph of it to record it what does it actually mean what are the implications of this kind of a question now this is such a deeply interesting question and one of the foundational questions of philosophy of history because uh, you know uh, history is uh, is a great contention about the idea of the past and therefore what constitutes a past becomes extremely important um, philosophical question and i i mean i'm calling it philosophical question but it's a question which i'm sure all of us have thought about and engaged with we just you know when i when i invoke the idea of philosophy here it just gives us a set of vocabulary and ways of looking at that uh, particular concept and um, i already talked about an ontology of an event it also raises a very interesting question about nature of absence because remember one thing which an archive is obviously doing it is replacing something which is not there with something else it is replacing for example the fact that there were people here in 1995 or 96 and then i replace them with a set of photographs of what happened on those particular days there is a very deep interesting relationship between that idea of something which has happened which is absent now to me obviously 1996 is absent to me now but 1996 is present in a completely different manner so this question again um, you know although it might think um, you know why are people asking these kinds of questions i'll actually tell you why the question of absence is not only interesting for the question of archives it's a fundamental conceptual foundation of the idea of science itself so there are a lot of overlaps with between these ideas um, and the most important idea which very very often archives are associated with which is the idea of memory there is something about the idea of memory and obviously uh, you know memory is a Uh, is a red flag here in the sense that i know people work a lot on uh, biology of memory even at ncbs um, and i'm sure that you know biologists have engaged very deeply with it but what i'm going to say would be to look at certain kinds of ways in which people have uh, tried to look at memory from different disciplinary perspectives and that is the engagement which i think places like this archives in a science institute can do is to actually trigger discussions on what constitutes memory in the context of how an archive understands it and what uh, a biological understanding of it may be and finally the question of materialities which is again something which you are often concerned about because when you have something which is gone which is lost which is in the past or 
which has happened now, but you want to record it, you replace it with certain kinds of uh, material which you can keep, like as I said, photographs and letters and objects. What is the notion of materiality, which is very important for archives? Now, that to me is a larger question because the question of materiality is such a central question to the very idea of science itself. And later on, I'll try and uh, hopefully show you why that is so. Now, again, there have been uh, the, the connection to memory has also been made by archivists very, very deeply. So, for example, um, in a series of um, papers dealing with this question on the ideas of archives, memory, and identity, the uh, you know many of the scholars have been looking at this, understand something very special about archives' relationship with the idea of memory, with the concept of memory. So, <clears throat> as Schwartz and Cook point out, memory is rooted in archives, and archives are our memories. But many archivists would want to step out of being uh, restricting archives only to search some idea of memory. So here, what is of interest is our understanding of what memory itself means. It's not about whether archives are about memories or not. How do you define what a memory is? And that's why I want to go back to use this formulation to think a little bit about this. And uh, when you ask these questions, you can also understand that archives do other kinds of function. Which, for example, um, when you look at archives as evidence for a very many important archives, for example, in the conciliatory reconciliation um, uh, movements in South Africa, you know, questions where people have been asking about justice for what has happened, people have been asking questions of archives as functioning as evidence of what happened, and that, you know, again in philosophical term, it's about producing certain knowledge. Archives becomes a site a place from which you produce something, something called knowledge. So it has a very important, what we would call as an epistemological function. And it also has another function, which is very important and interesting in the context of its relationship, particularly to biology. And that's a question of the fact that as um, some scholars point out, archives remember. So it's not just a question of somebody sitting and collecting something, there's a particular agency, there's a particular dynamic functioning of an archive. And that's what I call as an agency, something which, uh, which makes it act in a particular manner. So ar archives act, act, archives, quote unquote, live in that sense. So um, this dynamic agential action of, uh, of archives is something which will complement our idea of what we mean by memory. Just so that we remember that archives are not just a static collection of some memorial instances and something which you place around. So while these are, uh, so these bring the question of the archives and memory very closely to each other. So I want to begin with a proposition. So when I was thinking about this, the point that struck me most, most strongly was very, a very simple point that Really, for me, the paradigm, so what, what are we looking at? We're looking at archives as a way which can allow us to accumulate and store and record memories, et cetera. Certain notions of past and putting them together in this sense. So to me, what is the, so there are two very interesting things here. And, and you can think about it in, as I said, from any uh, disciplinary context. And the simple, uh, uh, the simple contradiction here is this. You have something called memory, you have something called materiality. You have something called the past, which is gone, which is absent. And you have something which is recording it in terms of certain material artifacts. What is this relationship between these two? And what, where is a model for us which can allow us to understand this relation? And so, um, so I thought the best way perhaps to start looking at it and also because it connects very closely to questions of biology, that to me, the argument that I begin with is the paradigm of memory that is already located in material is the body. And therefore, when I look at body here, there's a human body and there's an archival body. Your places you're sitting in the archive is the body of the archive. And the human body itself functions as an archive. So I wanted to understand how can I make an argument about the fact that the human body actually functions as an archive? And why does it seem to me that this is a meaningful position to start with? One, because the human, we do have memory, we store memory. And as biologists have been doing so many experiments on this, we retrieve memory, we search for memory, we only selectively certain memories are stored in the body, et cetera. 
So you already have a model of that, but I wanted to explore the consequences of looking at a question of an archive in terms of this idea that the body and the archive share certain very striking similarities. So among the commonalities between a body and the archive are of course the questions of memory and a materiality and a connection, a transference of things which you want to hold and store in particular ways. There is also a, a very important argument and right from very early understanding of trying to understand what body is, that body also has a very important function of what we call memory making. We keep producing memories. You might say we act in so many different, uh, for so many different contexts, etc. But one of the very important, um, you know, one of the very important things of our acting is actually to produce memories which we store as memories. We remember what we will be performing. And there's a very interesting aspect of this dynamic action of what the body does in the context of memory making. And there also seems to be a very fascinating, um, you know, the fascinating way relationship between body and its action in the context of memory. And I, I was just going through some of your NCBS work and I saw one of your colleagues has uh, done something on stress and memory, I think it was strategy. Um, so you, you're, so there are influences, there are, there are contexts in which your body is able to remember some things and it just doesn't remember many things. There are cases I'm sure all of you remember I mean, if you think about it, you will see there are certain contexts and situations which you don't remember at all. And it's quite interesting. What is the function of a body um, in, in selection of these kinds of uh, memories? Is it that there is an agency to the body that it is able to choose and select what memory to store and what not to store? Or is it that you might come up with various kinds of, let's say, causal biological explanations like maybe stress does something and that you don't remember certain memories and you remember certain memories. Would that be one of the ways in which to understand it? So this question is actually very important because it is also a central function of an archive. And as I'm sure an archivist and Venkat will tell you this, that you, the biggest struggle is to know what to keep and what to, I don't know, discard may not be the right word here, what to keep, what not to keep, how to order what you keep and so on. Um, Another very important uh, function of a body, which again, as I said, particularly in social, uh, social science literature, it repeatedly comes back uh, in, in describing the body as a narrative machine. Uh, bodies do this very important function of narrating, telling you stories, connecting episodes, making sense of events which are temporarily displaced by connecting them in various ways. And narratives are also very integral to what an archive does. And the way you produce a narrative in an archive is actually very interesting. Sometimes it may be obvious, sometimes it may not. It may happen right in the way you categorize your objects and you're actually doing a particular framework of narration within what you uh, keep. So there are many of these other points about the relationship between body and memories, which are also very similar to some of the questions of um, you know, the way in which the uh, archives engage in the questions of memory and records. And as I said, yeah, uh, from my very, very limited knowledge of what uh, happens in biology, uh, memory is materialized in the body. When I try and make sense of what, how biologists talk about memory, it's often in terms of certain chemicals, it's in terms of um, you know, certain kinds of reactions in, with chemicals and so on. So there are these questions which are obviously common um, to biologists too. Now, I, I want to take this opportunity. Um, I don't know how many of you are biologists here, but it doesn't matter. I want to take this opportunity to, since I think this context is biological, to actually um, uh, try and um, engage with this community about other possible ways of trying to understand memory in its relationship to the body using the framework of an archive. Okay. So, um, First of all, and there's something which is a topic which I really like, so it, it somehow it tends to creep into many of the things I do, uh, which is the idea of the concept of absence itself. And not only is the concept of absence philosophically interesting, it's also an essential part of various scientific discourses. I mean, you may not deal with it as a concept when you do science, but if you look at, if you look at the philosophical foundations of science, the idea of absence comes in various ways. 
and it has very deep implications of how we understand um, various phenomena and so on. Typically, and this is primarily from a Western philosophical tradition, which has influenced the growth of modern science to a great extent, there is a particular problem of absence. So the problem of absence is the fact that why, so you can phrase this in a very cognitive sense, right? So let's phrase it in terms of, um, you know, perception. So if you phrase it in terms of perception, when I'm perceiving this chair, I'm seeing some positive entity called the chair. So I can see the chair. I, I think I see some object. I think I can experience certain qualities in that object. The point about absence is, absence seems to be a complete void. There is nothing positive. There is no specific, uh, uh, specific thing which my absence can get hold of like my presence can. So presence is positive in that sense. It has positive content. Um, absence seems to have negative content. But so, and therefore, I could say, to give you a very simple example, I could say I'm seeing a chair, which is a positive content. And I could also say, I am not seeing an, um, a camel. I'm, but that could also be a kind of an understanding, a kind of a relationship to the question of absence in front of me. But the problem is, when I see a chair, I see only a chair. But when I do not see a camel, I also do not see an elephant. I also do not see uh, Putin sitting here, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, this is a very, a very interesting question which goes back to the root of philosophy of language in trying to make sense of what are called negative terms, okay? But there is conceptually um, an archive and the question of memory is engaging with absence. Remember that. And because many things have gone past, many things have happened in 1996, let's say. So if you can't, you, you can ask me what is in front of me now, I'm able to tell you, let's say in 2022, but I don't know the kinds of possibilities that are open in 1996 is much, much, much more. So it's a very similar question about the very conceptual foundation of absence and how we deal with it. I, uh, rather than getting too much into this, I just want to point out to you that um, one of the ways in which the question of memories, both in the body and the archive, can be recovered in a very interesting, useful manner is to conceptualize and think about the possibility that absences are real. Absences are real in the sense that your perceptions are real, that they have a connection to uh, the positive content that we really see. And um, so I want to rephrase this question about absence in the context of an archive and in the context of the body to say is that how much of the task of the archive is to recapture this absence? There is an absence which has happened and it is the archive and it is the body for whatever reasons, which has to engage with it. We do not live our life saying that today is March 11, 2022. And that's all I'm interested in. It's, by the way, it's a, uh, it's a field within philosophy, which is often referred to as presentism, trying to understand your experiences in the world in terms of just the concept of the present, rather than invoking the ideas of the past or, of course, the future. And the interesting point, I think, which we need to um, um, uh, think a little bit more about is to say, if the task of archive, if you explicitly understand the task of archive as recapturing this absence, so two ways of answering is to say, look, I don't believe in all this thing called absence. It's all emptiness and you know, you're just confusing things much more than what they are. Or you could actually look at um, theories of absence, which actually give you a very profound understanding of the nature of absence rather than running away from the question of absence. So two of them, very briefly, I'm not gonna talk uh, much about it. One is to talk about absence as real. Uh, one of the striking formulation of the Indian logical philosophical tradition called the Nyaya. And uh, for the Nyayikas or the followers of Nyaya uh, school, the question of absence is as a real uh, entity is a very, very important uh, foundational structure in their philosophy. And there's a lot of very interesting debate they have with the Buddhists about whether absence is real and how do we understand absence, etc. And they have different formulations they not only talk about absence as real, but they also give you a classification of the number of types of absences. So just like saying there are a number of types of presences which are present, there are types of absences. And a very simple example, of course, to tell you is that, you know, before an object is formed, it is absent. And after the object is broken off, it is absent. And you seem to have a notion of a content of absence. Remember that perception is positive because you have a content. I say I'm seeing this chair because I have a content that there is a chair that I'm seeing. 
The moment I can give you content of absence, you are actually re reducing this question uh, in to use their uh, term. You would say you perceive absence, and I think this point about perceiving absence, which was such a problematic idea for the Western metaphysical systems, which as I said is very closely uh, aligned to many of the foundations of our scientific disciplines, is actually a uh, very different in the context of what the Nayayikas and the Buddhists do, because there is a simple commonsensical understanding of how you perceive absence. Suppose I give you this argument that yes, I see the chair. So we, you, all of you see this chair and we perceive it. But suppose I tell you, I do not see an elephant. And that statement that I do not see an elephant is a statement which is also reporting a perception. It is also a perception which all of you will agree with me. Presumably, there's nobody in this room who is seeing an elephant here. Just like all of you in the room presumably are seeing the chair. So in terms of the logic of perception, the structural logic of what you perceive and the content of what you perceive, absence is not that different. Our, our recognition that we perceive absences are extremely important. And I think Arkai brings us a conscious recognition that we are consciously dealing with absence, which otherwise might be forgotten. So, um, you know, that, that really through, you may invoke the ideas of uh, memory and so on, but there is a particular idea of perception of absence that I think um, will make somebody, I mean, will make me, um, assert, in a sense, something which is open for discussion, that archives are fundamentally involved with the reality of absences, converting absence into the real in some sense. And rather than just it being a, a, a you know, a rhetorical uh, turn of phrase, what I'm trying to say is that for philosophically thinking through the idea of absence and the notion of the real, this actually has very deep substantial meaning. When I say that absences are fundamentally involved with the reality of absences, and archives, the task of archives is to, is to make visible, is to make visible absence of various kinds. And that's what would actually uh, help you uh, open up very different context of how you structure an archive, uh, how you uh, communicate with an archive and so on. So um, much of what I've been saying holds good, like as I said, for the archive, as also for the human body. So I want to push this analog you a little bit and your first response to what I said could be very simple. You could say, well, you know, the body, when you talk about archive as a, like a body, you're probably, you're using the word body just as a metaphor. And whenever um, for non, um, you know, literature students, when they say, oh, it is just a metaphor, you know, I'm sure you'd see a lot of literature students jump up and say, there's nothing called just a metaphor. Because a metaphor has far more greater significance than what we understand in our traditional teaching of language as a difference between literal and metaphor. Literal, which somehow captures the truth, metaphorical as being something poetic and saying something which doesn't seem to be actually true. Very interestingly, the human body, even as a metaphor, has been one of the most important metaphors in organizing much of our disciplines. In fact, if you look at body as a metaphor, Architecture is very deeply influenced by our body as a metaphor. We build houses, for example, it is true, many studies show, for example, in temples, that the structure of a building, the structure of a building, the structure of a temple, etc., are organized around the organizing principles of a body. And not only, um, so that's why when I say body of an archive, I'm not, you could say, even if I'm using it as a metaphor, an archive is structurally analogous to the way we understand the body. So this is just as a uh, first thing, because we know that there are so many examples of how bodies function as metaphors. Forget about buildings and temples and archives. Society itself is modeled on the metaphor of a body. The best example of it is a caste system. The caste system, if you look at the famous example of the four Varunas, and then of course the, uh, the fifth outcast, what you have is actually the descriptions of the caste system in Indian thought or Hindu thought is primarily in terms of the metaphor of the body. Okay, with different varnas associated with the head, the Brahmins right down to the Shudras to the feet. And what the body does is it gives you an image, a particular structure by which you begin to make sense of society. 
you begin to associate qualities and this is why metaphors just don't remain some poetic thing once you understand the society is broken up in the head body leg and foot then you begin to associate qualities of our body head body etc on to those communities who are represented you know isomorphically with these uh, body parts so the head the brahmins are the you know whatever thinking ones etc whatever the functions of the head does are associated communicated to the community and that influence by the way on the caste system is a very very important influence and one of the reasons how in many of the discourses on caste and our difficulty in engaging with the question of caste in the larger social context is also deeply related to the way people make sense of caste by invoking questions of the body this enters into our language in so many different ways even today even if you look at completely different uh, global analysis of how we use language to talk about uh, body we use terms like head of state face of the law heart of society etc in all of them uh, we you, we think of the body as ways in which um, uh, you know gives us a way to understand meaning of something else called society so here the point about using a body is i am encountering a phenomena and how do i make sense of the phenomena but itself i can't and therefore i use this metaphorical connections to body to make sense of it in a uh, recent time there has been quite a bit of work on this to show how uh, to uh, to understand how biology metaphors are often used to describe social communities and this is extensive in fact uh, over recent time if you look at during the immigration crisis in europe and so on you will see so much of uh, work coming out from europe on this on how much in popular discourse you use terms like these communities are virus and these are parasites and um, you know they are pathologies which have to be cut out from a society they are cancerous to the society and so on so a lot of biological pathological vocabulary from biology enters into the way of talking about social communities and organizations and again remember that the implications of this is not just as if it's some poetic description no we are completely mistaken if you think it's just some other kind of a de description uh, because you are you feel you are feeling very creative the point we need to recognize is metaphors are not just poetic because they cognitively order the world for us some of the one of the most important work by uh, linguists and cognitive scientists particularly lakoff and johnson's work on what are called conceptual metaphors point out repeatedly that what whenever we talk about a particular concept we make sense of it by associating it with uh, metaphorically with other things which we know well so for example when i'm confronted with a particular kind of immigration as a problem then i make better sense of it i cognitively understand it and cognitively make uh, intervene in that society in that problem of immigration by making myself understand it by using bodily metaphors or in this case biological metaphors so so first of all when we talk of uh, archives as a body even if you say it's metaphorical i say there's nothing to say by ordinarily metaphorical because metaphor metaphors order uh, reality for us and moreover in the case of the relationship between the body and the archive the body itself functions as an archive and the question that i then pose if i start with this question that the body functions as an archive then the simple question uh, which we can ask is to say what then is the model of a body that can accommodate memory and the archiving of the body what is it that allows us what kind of a theory of the body do you need which can accommodate this whole experience of memory and the experiences of the body as well as its capacity to function as an archive okay there are, you can extend this question to many other things but i'm i'm just going to uh, uh, restrict myself to just memory and archiving how does how is the body an archive in that sense what do i expect of the body i know what i expect of an archivist i say that the archivist must be somebody who knows various things who can collect things who has the capacity to collect store order etc what can you expect of a body to be able to do this job of memory and archiving and for that what we need is of course one the idea of what memory is and then of course the idea of what body is now both of which as biologists perhaps all of you know this far better than maybe uh, people who don't work in this discipline do but i want to um, um, you know share some ideas from the larger uh, i mean the discipline of philosophy to try and see how how can you make sense of a very different kinds of understanding of what memory is and what body is 
And therefore, the kind of questions and challenges that they pose to biology is inherent in this, but I'm not posing it directly. Um, but you know, if anybody wants to talk about it, we always could. So let me give you a very quick summary of certain ideas of philosophy of, uh, of, of certain philosophical questions about memory. Again, memory is a topic which philosophers love for a variety of reasons, right? Because it really deals with things which are not, which, which is not easily transferable to empirical sciences. It's still like a domain. I mean, since scientists take over everything which philosophers have been doing, at least there are certain fields they want to hold on to, which they feel, you know, you can't easily enter. And memory allows you a variety of these things to do that. And also, by the way, including the body. So, so, so the point when I'm, when I'm, I'm going to look at certain uh, themes, some philosophical themes which come from trying to understand the nature of memory. Okay, and memory is not just about, okay, so many things. I'm not going to say what it is not about. So one of the very important arguments which um, scholars have been making is that memory is irreducibly multiple, that there's nothing called memory, which captures every type of memory that you have. We actually have different types of memories. And they may have, therefore, you may have very different type of storages, retrieval, dot, 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 I don't know, you know, which whatever way you want to understand the dynamics of memory. So even though I say, do you have good memory or you lost your memory or gained your memory, we know that there are multiple types of memories and they are irreducible in the sense they are independent of each other and they, are, uh, they, they capture very distinctive uh, cognitive capacities and therefore we have to give an account of the different types of memories. And first of all, you have to give an account of why all of them are something called memory and then say why are they distinct and how are they uh, different uh, in that. Um, there has also been, um, you know, growing work within philosophy, which tries to argue that memory is best, uh, best understood as a form of imagination. And the question about seeing and imagination has always been a fundamental point of contradiction in memory. Because, um, you know, I see a chair, for example, that's an act of perception. And then I have a memory of having seen the chair. So let's say I will leave the room, I go back to my house. And then somebody asked me something about the talk and I say, oh yeah, I was standing right next to that green chair. And I have a memory of that having seen that chair. So there is, a, there, uh, you know, traditionally when people spoke about memory, they always made the distinction between perception and imagination. Just like imagination was seen to be a very different kind than uh, the act of seeing. But um, there's been increasingly work which is trying to argue that uh, memory is best seen as a form of imagination, not just as a, as a form which is uh, not dynamic enough, but it is a very dynamic act of imagination because it's related to uh, ideas such as consciousness, uh, images and emotion and so on. So that really opens up the way you can uh, theorize about what uh, memory is. And in philosophy of memory, what is also of great interest, and this is also something which um, it, uh, goes into the way we can understand and define memory, which is the relationship between memory and personal identity. In fact, one of the things which, you know, one of the fascinating things about memory and its relationship to the body, um, which is something which is very interestingly mirrored in the context of the archive is that, you know, you have many memories. I have many memories, but you also have a memory or you have a feeling that all those memories have happened to you. You could have had a memory 10 years back something, and then five years back, and then two years back, and then something yesterday, and what unifies is they're just, I mean, if they're just memory beds which have happened, I can record it and put it on the plate that they've happened. But memory does another very interesting function. And that's, I mean, this is why questions of how biology can enter into this, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I, in my view, a lot of very interesting scope and philosophy engages with these philosophical questions. I mean, biology engages with philosophical questions, which is that it is not just the very act of having one memory or a collection of 10 memories in my head. Let's say I've stored all these 10 different memories in my head. What is also that experience that makes me think that all those memories have happened to me, to one individual? If memories are just events which have happened in the past, right? If they have just things which have happened in the past, they have happened. It's independent of me or anybody else, some things have happened. But when I, when memory in the, in the way in which we often use memory in our own lives, is to give us a deep sense of the notions of self. It reproduces, it produces, it modifies our notions of what we are as individuals and as self. And, and that is where it has very close connection to narrativity. 
we connect memories within ourselves to tell a story to ourselves oh you know that's what happened two years back and that's what happened last year and that's what happened yesterday dot 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 and that is an act coming from where and where does there's this choice of connecting certain memories happen in your narration why is it that there's so many memories don't fit into that narration who is doing this job of connecting them in a way in which you can create a narrative of the self you know how do theories of memory engage and acknowledge with this point which is a, as i said something which uh, philosophers are deeply interested in and as expectedly of course they're also very interested in the question of time because there is much enormous amount of work on philosophy of time and etc various things related to that and um, there have been arguments that memory is an example of what some people some philosophers have called as mental time travel that you actually when you recollect a memory or when you experience a particular memory what you actually do is you do a mental time travel and there are you know as obviously like in many interesting philosophical discussions a lot of arguments for this etc very importantly and connected to the question of the archive and i think definitely the questions of identity is central to the archive so also the last point i don't know if you can see it here um uh, it is how memory produces collective identities and this very fascinating story about you know the individual and the social and it opens up in various things but think of this example memory produces collective identities we collectively remember something we collectively remember the independence of the country for example what is it that allows what was seen as an individualized something sitting inside your brain to be have the capacity to produce collective mobilization collective identities it goes back to a very deep question in philosophy of social science something which my last book really engages very deeply with on how the idea of the social itself is formed how does the idea of the collective form from perhaps from individuals but maybe it has something else more than that so um you know that is also i think uh, a very important um, question about memory and there are other kinds of questions which we can have about memory and its relation to knowledge and um, uh, very interestingly uh, the point about memory in a lot of times when people have responded uh, when people have been critical of memory uh, one of the strongest sustained criticism of the idea of memory is that memory by itself cannot produce new knowledge because memory is only a record of what something has happened and her memory by itself does not have the capacity to produce new knowledge and this is a point which you have some philosophical traditions very deeply critical of it and i'll just give you a very quick uh, one about that but uh, there is a lot more question about whether the idea of memory itself is actually a process of uh, of producing no new knowledge for example just to give a very quick introduction to one line on uh theories of knowledge in philosophy or you know the discipline called epistemology the first question you begin with what are the valid means of knowing how can i know something so i can say i know something because i see something i know something that is perception i know something because i have inferred which is logic i know something because i have read from a testimony that's testimony is knowledge but uh the question here is can memory also be a source of new knowledge and very interestingly if you look at indian philosophical traditions on whom i have written extensively on memory because memory is also a very important question for them and they question this particular question repeatedly and the most dominant indian philosophical traditions all reject memory for the reason that memory cannot produce new knowledge it does not have novelty present in it that has to be done by other things including maybe imagination but memory does not have that novelty a capacity to produce knowledge the only people who refuse that and therefore whenever indian philosophical systems or those of you may not know very quickly uh, every philosophical system in the indian context will uh, first start with your uh, your view or the opponent's view and then refute it with series of arguments so the only uh, philosophical system which refutes this is the jainas the jain philosophy philosophy uh, accept memory as what they call a pramana a valid means of knowing uh, and it's very interesting why they accept as a pramana um, it has very interesting connection to reincarnation etc but i won't go into that but it's also just to increase a larger question how do you have uh, your memory of your past life what kind of function does memory do 
is if that is the case how do you even make sense of it so there are very interesting debates on that but we also know that in modern psychology and biology there are many different types of classifications of memories like we have seen the earlier things just telling you were the philosophical questions which arise in trying to make sense of uh, categories such as ultra short uh, term memory ultra short term memory short ultra short term memory long term memory and then the declarative memories which are broken up into uh, things called episodic and semantic and non declarative memory very important kinds of memories which come without you having to articulate it sometimes in the context of uh, uh, work on uh, knowledge they call it tacit knowledge you know certain things to do and you do it you may not have a memory of uh, bicycle is always used as an example or swimming you don't have to have a memory of exactly what you did when you learned swimming you start uh, swimming or you start cycling right so those kinds of the functions of memory also seem to be there and one of i i just wanted to uh, leave this discussion um of memory in very briefly here um with uh, burks and at least to introduce for those of you who are not aware of um, one of the seminal works on the question of memory and its relationship to matter which is the biological question today um which is a, a very famous book by uh, henry uh, henry burks and called uh, matter and memory also published in 1896 it makes some very important um, idea you know formulations of memory uh, which are which you recover back in the kinds of new kinds of classification of memories in biology and psychology uh, but i thought there are a couple of two points three or four points which is worth keeping in the back of our mind uh, before i uh, try and do the last part of my talk a, a few minutes on the body and then end with the connection between the two so for bergson um the, the the very important point which bergson is making is that you have to make it um, you have to respond and react to the point that memory is secondary to perception so it is not that you perceive something and then you have memory and that memory is always dependent on perception and therefore it is secondary okay there's a very interesting parallel in western philosophy between speech and writing in a similar manner like your perception and uh, memory and therefore bergson argues that there is no perception without memories this is a fantastically interesting argument and um if you go think about it a little bit um you know to me it resonates so much with much of what i teach in philosophy of science when we talk about theory ladenness you know the fact that you cannot make observations of things whatever you observe is already has certain conceptual basis to it the even if i say i see a green chair i am already taking a perception and adding my co concepts to that perception it's not independent of the concepts including the word chair the word green etc etc so similarly uh, bergson's point that uh, per all perception is already memory filled uh, means that this kinds of capacities of making very uh, you know uh, facile distinctions between memory and perception i mean memory as secondary to perception is wrong and uh, importantly he was among the first to even argue that the types of memory are different and he talked about three types which is habit which is as i said uh, what he calls motor memory i don't have memory for example if i have to walk i just walk and there is no explicit invocation of memory for doing this so you don't try and remember how to walk that's one way of putting it right and um, there are also representational memory um, pure memory and so on so i i just going to point out just two other points because i think there are other things to worry about that brain is not the repository of memories is an important point he makes and now here obviously you are talking about a system in which is not reducible to you know your uh, material uh, objects and that therefore the question of what is in the brain and what is not in the brain which is a uh, you know if you are looking at a reductive uh, biological system you would want to see them as being uh, reduced into some particular things in uh, particular in the brain but to argue i mean his argument is coming from a philosophical point that a uh, brain is not the repository and memories are not in the brain because they are also related to the question of um, archives and therefore the last point which i am going to talk about and the last theme which i'll keep it very brief is to ask the following questions which is that can a physical biological body give an account of the phenomenology of memory that is taking into account all the characteristics of memory taking into account the experiences you have of memory forget about somebody reporting on memory it's not a theory of memory in our own experiences of memory all that you think you have can a physical biological body with the way we understand it can it give an account of it uh by asking the question i'm not saying it cannot give an account i'm just saying can it give an account 
if I want to take into account all these other kinds of philosophical questions that I've asked. And two, um, more important in the context of my, you know, trying to make sense of what, it, what is to have an archive in a biological institute, uh, given the archive's relation with memory, can different theories of the body, okay, and accepting in some sense, maybe biologists are not going to accept different theories of the body, right? When I hear this whole fight they keep having with Ayurveda and allopathy itself, I don't see the hope of them hoping, opening up ways of understanding different theories of the body. But if you do, then can different theories of the body give new models for the body of an archive? Can an archive, since it's structured in the body, the body of an archive, and uh, not just as a metaphor, then if what is that body, what is the model of the body in which an archive is based on? Okay, that to me, um, you know, in thinking through this, I, for me, that seemed to be a very important uh, way to think through, to make sense to myself. And my hope is I can make a little bit of that, communicate the little bit of question to you. Um, so the way I want uh, you approach this is very simple. The first question is, why don't you just accept the biological body? Just say this is the right thing. And, you know, obviously we have had very intelligent scientists tell us what the biology of a body is and it is there. And what is this point? What is the problem that you have about the biological body? Okay, and that's a very different debate altogether. So uh, let me begin with another kind of an empirical thing. How a very large number of scholars and thinkers and practitioners in different disciplines other than, let's say, in the heart sciences or biology have proposed different theories of the body. So in a sense, I'm, without taking sides on what it is, because let's say I don't understand any of them, but I'm looking at this multiplicity of theories of body and I want to make sense of it. Why is it that across these different disciplines, people are invoking different types of theories of body? So today, if you try and look at the kinds of um, different structural ideas of body which are present coming from many different directions, and many of these are very, very influential um, across different disciplines. Okay, and those of you who are social science students might know this well. There is a notion of a lived body, which is very important. You know, it has a very different uh, set of questions about first person experiences, the centrality of first person experiences. Um, the argument that there are things called uh, mindful body. And the mindful body is actually an um, interesting variation of the question uh, of the fact that the, the distinction between the body and the mind is not tenable. And that itself is, I'll, come, I'll make one more uh, point about it later on. So like you have the mindful body, there's a social body, there's a body politic, uh, which looks at the body, not in terms of your cell actions and the organs and so on. It also looks at it in terms of the way in which history functions in the production of what the body is and how the body does. You have uh, the body as a symbolic system, uh, body as a locus of social practices. You have medical body, medical disposal. I was very happy to see that the exhibition, which is uh, going to open next week in the archives, uh, actually has a lot of very interesting things to say about this capacity of making sense of a medical body when put into confrontation with the other kinds of bodies. So that's one thing which I felt was, you know, something which immediately struck me when I was watching that, um, that there are these kinds of questions about what is this body that is being, um, let's say, x-rayed, okay? And I have a medical uh, report of it. That's a report, like the archival report. What is that? What does it have to do with my experience of what is happening inside my body or the way I make sense of the experience of my body? Very interesting question. And um, so you have all these kinds of different uh, types of bodies and different disciplines hold on to these bodies as if they are different from, in some essential sense, from a reductive biological body. That's the basic question. And again, again, it's not a question of whether they are right or wrong, et cetera. You know, philosophical discussions are not about that, but in trying to make sense of why somebody wants to say something and are they really different? Can all these kinds of bodies be reduced to, uh, can, can biology reduce, you know, explain all the functions of these different bodies and so on. Very interestingly, uh, to add to this complexity of it, and one, uh, you know, for many of you, this may sound really absurd, but in the context of philosophical thinking about this, um, a very long tradition from Indian philosophies, many, um, uh, you know, philosophies coming from Nyaya, Sankhya, Buddhist, Jaina, and remember that Buddhist, Jaina, and Nyaya are the so-called rational traditions, and the Buddhist and Jaina are the Gnostic traditions, which is quote-unquote atheistic traditions and so on. Um, so this is, not, this is not coming from quote-unquote religion in that sense, right, which is a very typical way uh, people tend to misunderstand Indian philosophies. So if you look at a common element in the description of a body in Indian thought, it is that the body, a physical body, has a gross manifestation and a subtle manifestation. 
and therefore there is always something called gross matter and subtle matter and what is interesting about it is um, you know uh, the fact that the mind body distinction which if you recollect comes to us in modern scientific disciplines from descartes when descartes is postulating the possibility or well asserting if you like that mind is a different kind of substance from the body so substance is a philosophical term okay descartes is drawing from a long history of the idea of substance as a foundation if you like of things and says mind is of a different kind of substance compared to the body and that therefore leads to very interesting questions right at descartes time and uh, post descartes which is that if mind is so different from the body how do you explain the mind body connection how does the mind make the body do something let's say you said oh i want to jump mind you thought about it which is a function of the mind and therefore you jump so let's assume that you are right but the question which is posed and descartes goes into convoluted attempts to explain it um and then of course it has various implications in contemporary um, philosophy including in philosophy of mathematics and this is a very simple question if two things are very similar and this is a question of materiality if my hand is physical and this uh, or this podium is physical then i can understand the action of my hand on the podium when my hand pushes the podium i can understand it more because i can reduce it to the way the two materialities clash or the fact that they share the same materialities mean that i can do this but what is this uh, model that you have of a mind which is fundamentally different from matter uh, how how do you think it influences matter you go one step further this is a question asked in philosophy of mathematics a very famous question called banasarev's question which is that if mathematical entities are seen to be not even mental they are non spatio temporal they don't exist in space and time then how can they have any correlation to the nature of our world it goes it you know it goes back to the heart of the problem about the use of mathematics in the sciences okay another very fascinating question so if so here is a theory of the body in which you do not have a mind body duality problem because mind itself is a form of subtle matter there is a difference in the material types of the body and mind now um again i'm not placing this in opposition to how you might want to look at your biological understanding of this but i also think one of the great things about uh, science is this capacity to be open minded and you know take into account the possibilities of very different radical ideas and then see which are meaningful to you and which are not very interestingly the idea of the subtle body is also something which is present across traditions across asia and african and western civilizations and um, many of the times it is for you know, trying to give us an explanation for the interaction of physical matter with consciousness mind etc so one can do a bi biology of the human body by saying well consciousness mind etc may be there i'm not interested directly in what they are if i don't have a physical correlate but um there are also these competing theories of the body which uh, are quite different and they are different not because they you know somebody thinks it it has to be different and it sounds very interesting but because all these formulations of the body including the structure of how to make uh, idea of the senses the organs and so on come because they are a constant attempt to make sense to explain the experiences that we have of the human body and memory is a fundamental experience of that so therefore if uh, you know just as one poetic excursion into this just to open up our possibilities of thinking about it one could ask are there subtle and gross aspects to memory and uh, for those of you who think this whole thing is really bunkum i don't understand what this question of materiality is the strongest answer to any naive reduction of matter to physical matter to this gross matter the best example actually comes from science it doesn't come from religion i mean whatever people might say or meditation or other techniques it actually comes from the success in the practice of physics if you look at physics and the development of physics and theories of physics one of the most important ways we make sense of it is to uh, one of the narratives which you can impose on the development of physics is to recognize that it is a constant struggle to build theories of materiality you can see this right from newton's principia uh, his magnum opus book of 1687 uh, which is where you have his laws of motion and the derivation of the gravitational laws etc 
it uh, from there when he begins with the first definition in that book when he says mass i begin by defining mass as a quantity of matter and does not tell you what matter is it comes from that throughout in the history of the development of various kinds of theories in physics it's a constant struggle to make sense of what is matter to the extent that when you uh, there have been attempts to uh, you know reduce matter to various other qualities uh, within various scientific theories and uh, when um, einstein was asked to write the foreword for a history a very good uh, book Uh, in history and philosophy of science uh, by max jammer called concepts of mass he makes in a short preface he says well i don't he, you know in a sense almost i'm just paraphrasing he says i don't understand what the deal with all this matter and mass is because after all the only things are real are fields and it is not just the question of the reality of the fields which are not material like the physical material that you understand but it's also the fact that as i said the earlier question about mathematics that there is no modern science possible particularly the physical sciences without looking at the reality of mathematical entities and that's called platonism and it's a very important um, um you know question which we need to look at and therefore i think to me the question it is it leaves behind this what kind of materiality is special to biology you know um if a lot of our understanding of uh, materiality in physics to understand the development of physics across relativity and quantum theory etc and uh, including um, you know various other complex systems the question of materiality has been at the core of much of its conceptual struggle then what kind of materiality uh, can i conceive of in biology what kind of materiality can can does a space of biological thought open up it's something which of course i have not, no, nothing to say i don't know anything about it but it's a question at least was triggered by this and i will just therefore end with this question of um you know i just put all of this together so i want to leave this with you um the it's you know this is a much larger question um again i go back to the question of the arc curve and why it is not just um uh, a simplistic reproduction of something that left kept in a room right there is a particular agency which functions in archives and our point is to make sense of this agency and this is a very important question right from the body what is your agency in your body what what is the agency what do i mean by what is the agency in your body why does your body act the way it does is it because the mind tells you to act is it because we have something called consciousness this locus of authority this locus of action which is so special to the understanding of the body is also something integral to the very idea of an archive there is agency in an archive and that's why the people are worried about archives too because archives wants to say something like i said earlier it wants to uh, like i had quoted uh, these people there and they said it it's not just about seeing the world in a particular way it also is about how you want others to see you you produce an archive so that you can present yourself in particular ways to them you know before coming i was just talking to venkat about very difficult documents and artifacts like let's say secret material or confidential material in an archive and who can access it and who can't access it and the your choice is also about how you want to present something to it so archive you know in general has this very important role it's a agential role and sometimes you can explicitly state it sometimes you may not the body has an agential role who is acting in the body okay uh, ranging across from very traditional um doctrines from philosophical doctrines to contemporary philosophy this question still is very important Uh, does the body act by itself you talk to dancers and they call this they, when they talk about body intelligence and body memory they are not talking about the mind telling them whether to jump up and kick and stuff they you invoke the idea of body memory the body does what it wants because it decides what to do it decides what actions to make on the stage and that notion of agency completely changes this biological understanding certain very limited biological understanding of the human body and i think that's a larger trouble which science anyway has with the idea of agency and authority of nature so a lot of uh, questions of who acts why is something happened that way in science has been put under the idea of nature so instead of saying god made objects go around the thing you say nature makes the uh, sun go around the earth go around the sun but what is that agency that nature has and what is this thing called nature again this is not some um you know um big question it's one of the central questions in philosophy of science uh, some of the best work on history of science has been to understand and recognize how nature is constructed 
uh, within science so as to uh, give it this power to be agential and operative and so on. And therefore, I believe in the final question, um, which is that what are the implications for our idea of an archive, um, especially that um, for those that deal with biology? And I'm not limiting it to biology, but I'm taking the liberty of uh, trying to situate and contextualize the archive sitting in ICBS here among biologists to be able to ask this question um, because I think it opens up great conversations, both with the idea of an archive and with the very idea of biology. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shalukai, for that very thought-provoking lecture. Uh, I think it's only apt that the first lecture of the year would make not only the archive of the but also balance to the question of what we do on a day-to-day basis. Uh, and so I do want to reflect on this intersection that we found that uh, today. Um, we will now open up the floor for any questions to the focus. Please go ahead and make your question and we'll answer that on the So as um, as an archivist at this point, one of the things we struggle with, especially in the last section in our story implication, but like in a sense, the people in the room who are valuable are the people who sort of generate the materials and then people have the chance to come in to recognize the archivist. Um so one of the problems that we've been having in this room is in how reflective is the object of the process of science, you know, the, the, the imagination that the conceit of the object, the object captures uh, mm. that process. And you know, like you said, you know, the you mentioned that you know, archives make those the last thing to all day. So one question that I want to bring back to when we when we constantly think in what are the activities that don't come, these objects that we that sort of enter the objects, you know, whether it's a paper or a photo or something like that, these objects can be sort of the, the remnants of the process. Uh, that there are things that are left behind, they're the found objects, we put those, we try and sort of reconstruct a little bit of what the process was. But the, so the question is the theme that I wouldn't share with the floor is left as an open ended question to talk about whether memory can be a source of new knowledge. Is this still an open ended question? Then? No, there are uh, no. I, I'm not putting it. Up. I'm just placing it as a larger debate which people have had within right. the philosophical stream on whether memory can really function legitimately as new knowledge. Right. Um, and if so, how? What is its relationship between memory and knowledge? So there are different arguments for both uh, sides. Okay. So I think it, so. It depends on how strongly an argument comes. So, so I guess some maybe my very limited archivist sort of standpoint. Memory is new knowledge um, in the sense that any act of, you know, any reenactment of, or in the sense that, you know, every oral history interview, every sort of enactment of memory so takes into account all the time that has passed from an event till date, and it's it's our perception of that which also takes into account all our experiences since then. And that so, can be new knowledge. So, I mean, the memory is nothing but new knowledge. It is always new knowledge in the, in the moment yeah. that it is enacted and shared. So that is what an interview does. When we, you know, at a very literal sense, when we speak to a scientist and we ask them about processes. No, that's not what they're talking as memory. Memory is just a memory of an event, I say. The narratives we put into memories, the performance which creates with memories, or the relationships we put with different memories, are things in the present. Which you as an archivist or anybody else, or the way I may read different, four different texts in different manner, and we suddenly think, oh, that's what we were trying to do. And I look at, you know, let's say Siddiqui's archives, for example. But that is a present event, that's not a memory. It is using memory as elements in a performance to produce new knowledge. Okay, that's fair. But I think the larger question which remains is that if I have one bit of memory, a piece of memory, an item of memory, or a major 
is that always dependent on something which has happened? And the reason why the struggle with imagination comes is I can imagine something which has not happened, and that's why we all that's why archivists are so important, right? Because we don't want me to give a different account of what happened when let's say NCBS was created. Uh, because you are just imagining it, that didn't happen. And when you say no, that didn't happen, and that's why the relationship with the archives are true, is a very different, very, it's also a very important topic from um, philosophers of memory. Um, but if you look at memory, just as a memory of something that I had, that seems to be not created. But even that, that's what Bergson challenges, and that's what the Jaina challenges are. But even that is open to uh, us. I think that the Bergson thing that is very Thanks, Dr. Sudha, for this fascinating uh, study work. Um, one thing that sort of uh, interests me, particularly because I just want to sort of vision function, has been the idea that you know, whether material sort of objects versus non material. How and the relationship between those two and then uh, affixing material object mm -hmm. or using or material objects as a sort of trigger mm -hmm. for a method, yeah. for instance, um, seems to imply a certain objectivity versus the lack of physical yeah. sense of. Non-material sort of triggers or non-material sort of nature of certain memories have a certain strength in certain communities that are much more difficult. Yeah, no, it's very judgmental. No, it's, 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 it's a very important question. You can see this political history, right? When people have tried to use history to, um, you know, the evidence of history in terms of material artifacts, because um, there are things which may have happened, but uh, history as a discipline or a particular kind of history of quote unquote scientific history wants to make sure that the data is only which is materially verifiable, etc. But we know that uh, in the context of even history, the historical processes in the world, or historical processes in ourselves, in the way we live our lives, moment to moment, because they are living the history, that there are many elements which are not, which do not leave a trace, material trace. Even a simple thing like smell is a very good example. You know, smell can trigger memory. Smell is one of the most important triggers of memories. You know, you can smell it, or even a sound, the things of sound which wraps by. But the point is now, you know, how do you make sense of the fact that that smell indeed corresponded to some memory that you had? And that's why I said the question of memory and imagination is a crucial problem. And that's a question which I think regulates a lot of objects. My, Understand it because you don't want to, you don't want the curator who is very imaginative beyond the point, right? Um, in a in a very really low sense of the word. Because a particular smell might trigger a memory, but that could have been your imagination. Maybe you dreamt about that smell connecting you with reminding you of a particular memory. Now there is no so one way to try and reduce it in terms of producing. So when you don't have physical evidence, you produce it. And one way is to relate and reduce memories into by your chemicals, and then you smell also into certain kinds of triggers, and you try and give an explanation. I'm not uh, questioning that particular approach, and you know that collective approaches have very really important um, you know, meaning in context, but it also misses the point that the particular phenomenology of memory, accounting for the different type of experience of memory, including the fact that how do different material objects come together as if they belong to me? If after all, each of the memories stored in various places, what is that notion that experience of I-ness or mind 
that will happen to you, come how do you? So there are, I'm not saying there are no answers, there are attempts even in psychology to make sense of, you know, reductive sense of the self and so on. But uh, that tension is going to be there. And I think the question of subtle matter, in, increasingly in the context of experimentation with the human body, seems to suggest that it's just a physical matter description of the body is not enough. Including the make sense of consciousness. Now, consciousness has been so far out of this purview that we're not talking about it. But, um, you know, that's going to be a challenging question. I don't know. I don't think I can make it a simple answer to how we go beyond the physical um, thing which seems to give us an objective proof, uh, in a sense. But uh, memories are, you know, an archive in that sense is a public memory. It's very really different from private. You know, nobody can dispute something happened to me 10 years back, even though none of you could have had experience of it. I don't have any material artifact. I just had it, I put it in my But archives want to do something it's in the context of the public. And my question is is this materialization the only public form of memory? Uh, but are there other kinds? And I think uh, part of, for example, performance, something which produces memory uh, as an artist, is very interesting to be an artist. Which can open up the space. So I think, in that sense, for me, the archaeobiology thing was an interesting thing because I think archives, the idea of archives and what we do with it, can pose certain uh, alternatives or challenges to biological understanding of human action. And particularly in a place where we set it up, and like this, to me, it seemed very exactly possible. So I want to put a question on the first thing. Where did you think historical artifacts should go? Should we remake the culture that have some like some issues for that elevated and ancient cultures and our geography like geography should be close by? Or should we go to societies that can care for them, that can be for them? Questions. The first one is about, you know, when you do this, uh, who does it belong to? Artifacts, because uh, historical artifacts. You know, one of the things I sort of found really interesting when I went to Delhi for the first time was that I went to remove these historical places, like I think the Kashmir and stuff. And you know, I was very surprised uh, that because I read that we probably read Delhi was only in terms of these sort of world rulers and like, school textbooks. And I was very surprised to find that they were not just living areas, you know, near all those, some of those places, they were also used as toilets. And these are supposed to be very old, ancient uh, things which are being built. And then I go and look at, uh, for example, it's a very old ancient monuments in the south, but particularly old temples in Tamil Nadu. They're all, they're not dedicated, they have become part of a lived life of uh, people. So there's always been a big question, and it's a larger question, which, by the way, has been a very important question among archivists and museumists and museumists in India. You know, what does a museum really do when you take away an artifact of the practicing lived culture, put in a museum? What does it actually accomplish? What does it really do? Uh, whereas valuing it by keeping it closed and not like not letting people touch out. You know, I still remember many of these old uh, two thousand year old buildings. They will. You know, people eat something, the particular is in a temple, they do something, they eat, and then they rock their hands on that. So you have years of deposits where people are rubbing their hands after the oily hand. But, you know, what has that, what has that historical sense been lost? What has been lost in that? Because for the people who come, and there's a very interesting point about this, and again, it's a, I'm just going to give it as a larger philosophical question, but a very fascinating question to think about. 
you know, so for a lived experience of the past, does it really matter if it's 1500 AD or 2000 AD? If it's 1500 years old or 3000 years old, or maybe 5000 years old, or even 10 years old. The value we give to time and past is a social value produced by a community. And that's a question we have to ask, when does that happen? Why does that happen? Who produces that value? By saying, well, there's 3,000 years old, that was something, you know, more prestigious than that. And that's, that, in fact, some people would argue that it is a commodified value. It's not just any social value. It's a value given for commodified transactions. And that's why a lot of people have very serious reservations about business. You know, so I, again, I, you know, I'm doing the classic thing of not answering you, committing to an answer which is really good. But uh, if you push me to it, I would say, as long as it plays a meaningful part in people's lives, then the artifact belongs to them. It's their artifact. And again, in the context of national museums, when a museum takes something which will make sense to my day to day life and keeps it in a museum in Delhi, where I have to pay money to go see that. Um, what sense does that make? So there are politics of the museum. So I would do that. The second point that language is really fascinating. And I know that initially when this question came, people were very upset. I heard there were some various there were only three people left, and somebody said sometime back this is only last person who spoke the language died, and so on. Then I remember also a linguist who has worked a lot on language said, uh, you know, if language is dying, they should die. And you know, if there are nobody to speak it, they should die. What's the point of having language if nobody wants to speak it? Um, you know, again, my quick answer to that is to whom is it a value that a language is dead? And if it is a value enough that it is important, then why is it for those people for whom it is a value they don't learn? So why why music might fight? Music might fight other than for historical context, other than as a record for something which is there. But as far as the the practice of language goes, this argument makes to some extent, and I feel bad when we use a language because language is culture, language is knowledge. There's nothing other than also that knowledge of language. But if I am not willing to learn the language and propagate, then what is my point in musifying it other than for instruction? There are, sorry? Yeah, there are Right. Yeah. So they don't have Yeah. No, it's a, you are very correct. The politics of language is not fair at all. And the politics of language is the politics of the rich and the powerful existence. And the fact that the margin lies, in the fact that even that small community of speakers are dying out, are, are, none of them are. Uh, you know, uh, Ambani's relatives or the uh, you know, big tech owners. So that is part of the reason. If they had been there, you know, that wouldn't have happened. So the fact is, I totally agree with you, and that's why for many of us who look at study language, language is culture, and when culture gets suppressed and eradicated, it is only political. It is not anything else. There's no natural, you know. So when, when this linguist friend of mine said this, he used a very problematic. A biological metaphor which I really shudder whenever I hear it is a survival of the best. You know, anything you think of, survival. They say language also, you know, the language cannot survive in this thing of thing. I totally, I mean, I, I disagree with that idea completely. But that politics is inherent to the function of language in society. And in India, so as we know today, look at the politics of language. It's so deep and has driven many of these things to entirely. I'm only talking, responding to the question of archiving, not about the classic knowledge. I'd like to ask the last question. I think you've spoken about uh, how the Salta is being the archive of the body of the soul. Now, I'd like to extend that to, to think about how would we see the act of archiving, the verb archiving itself, mm -hmm. saying that I do a little bit of history. And how can we understand that? I see it as an act of care. Act of care. 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 Huh? Care. That is caring for somebody else's life. Um, and how would you then extend this idea of archiving it as an action, as mm -hmm. an action mm -hmm. that can be done from the 
So the uh, this is another very good instance of how the function of archiving is very similar to how we understand body reaction. But I would also say that if you ask the question, how does the body function as an arc? That actually answers quite a bit about how archive should arc in that sense, right? At least to respond to this. Why does the body archive things? And here memory is the best thing. Why does it? There are so many things which say the body is in experience. You know, the vision, the, the five senses, our interaction with people, eating, all our food which goes in, etc. Some of which are archived and some of which are not. What is that idea? What is that agency in the body which is able to do? And again, a biological metaphor is very really useful because biological metaphor is that the body is trying to continue to have an existence. It wants to continue to live as it does this. But the body is also something, the phenomenon of the body is also one of the strangest of disease. So I think that tension between health and disease of caring for itself and not caring for itself, right, is something which is inherently present in the heart. You may want, suppose for example, you say I'm doing this archive for the care of others. It's a problem because somebody else may not want this thing. Or nobody will be interested in even doing that. So there has to be an internalization of the archival process in some sense. And I think the extensions of how a body really can be seen in the archive can help us do things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to bring this um, particular edition of our lecture series to a close. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to be with us on uh, our Friday evening. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Uh, before I, we wrap up today, I'd like to make uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, please do keep an eye out on social media and our website for the upcoming lecture for next month, um, which will also hopefully be in a talking concert in a short. We are also very excited to share that, uh, that the message, our exhibition will launch next week on the 18th this month, which is exactly what we say. Uh, and further well extend a lot of the ideas we spoke about today, so please do uh, make sure to spread the word and use the archives. And for those of you who are not from NCD and campus and would like a short tour of the archives, uh, please meet us outside and we'll be happy to give you a tour of the space. Uh, so we hope to welcome you all again on campus soon and thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.